<clears throat> Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? Russ here from Porkis Corner, the voice of hardcore boxing. I've got a bit of a treat for you today. The tenant members videos are done. The 20 YouTuber videos are done for the month. And that is me checking out for the rest of the month. But this is a bonus for you. Uh, we're gonna, so you've ended up with extra yet again. So all done in 20 days. So not bad, eh? Might be 21, actually, because it'll be out tomorrow, this. Right. Uh, I'm going to put a few videos on for you. Uh, sorry, a few questions on, on. I'm going to put a few questions on your lap here, Julian. See what you think. Yeah. Uh, first question. Who's your top five UK promoters at the moment? It's a great question. Um, you, you're probably going to hate the first answer. I don't think... It, we'll talk promoters, we'll talk who puts the best fights on, who puts the most frequent fights on, um, and who puts the most competitive fights on. I don't think it's a very deep field, if I'm being honest. Five might be a stretch. I'd, I'd probably say... You're going to hate this. I'd probably say Eddie Hearn's the, the best promoter in the country. Um, he gets a lot of things wrong. He doesn't deliver a lot of the big, big fights. So joint co-promoters don't deliver a lot, of, a lot of the big fights. I would say Eddie's probably the best um, of a very average bunch. I think Frank I think Frank Warren 20 years ago would have, 25, 30 years ago, would have blown him away. But Frank, I, I do believe that Frank's running out of steam to some extent. Um, and there's been a lot of Queensbury shows over the last few years. They're really, if you look through these in detail, they're really thin. There's a lot of to be announced on the right hand side and you might get a decent support and an half decent main event. I'd have Eddie Hearn one, I'd have Warren two. Um, for pure, I mean, Mick Ennis has got to be up there. I think I'd give Steve Woods a shout out actually because Steve Woods, you know, I've, I've my fighters in the past have been managed by Steve and they've been what on. What about Steve Phil Woods, Jeffries? So. What about Phil Jeffries? He's coming on strong, isn't he? Last six months. Yeah, he seems to be, doesn't he? He seems to be putting good stuff on. I mean, I might miss a few out, but I, th I think going back to Steve Woods, I just think because he gets his lads out all the time, he, he keeps yeah. his lads busy and he gets some big opportunities. And he's also done a great job. And what, what does a, a manager and a promoter do? Because it's hard to separate the two when Steve Woods is a manager and promoter. But I look at how he's developed people like Josh Warrington and Terry Flanagan. Nobody knew who those guys were. No one had a clue who they were. And how many promoters, you always ask this, this about Eddie, but how many promoters of managers have brought kids through who were basically unknown and taken them to world titles and, and made them quite a lot of money? So I think Steve Woods, just by keeping kids out there. Yeah, he doesn't have a TV deal. He has his own VIP promotions online. But the, the decent shows, um, I'm not as clued up on that side of things as, as you and Ken, and I've, I've, I'll openly admit that, uh, Russell, but I definitely have Eddie number one. Sorry. Um, I'd have Steve Woods up there just purely because of his service to the game and because there are people who enjoy those shows. They might not be on mainstream TV, but People enjoy the shows and he always gets a good crowd. Um, Mark Bateson puts on some cracking shows locally. I'm talking at a local level in Dewsbury. Uh, you never see a half-empty Mark Bateson show. But always the way, chocker, you know, aren't they? Always chocker. Really good value shows what Mark puts on. But I guess it's difficult when you look at the likes of, you know, Hennessy and, and everything else. And then you drop down several levels to these non-TV shows. But... I can't give you a, a definite top five. I can only say that. I think Eddie Hearn, you have to look at what he's done as well. You have to look at the fact that, you know, when fighters 10, 11, 12 years ago were fighting in sports centres for, for titles and there were four or 500 people there in Wigan Leisure Centre. And then he's made events of, well, I'll simplify it because I always give a long answer. Eddie has to be the best. Because Eddie packs out large arenas with pretty thin cards. Yeah. And isn't that the job of a promoter to sell shit? Well, that's what they do. They're the right scripts, don't they, on IFL? Yeah, he's, he's doing his job, isn't he? He's selling out the arenas. His fighters get paid well. Because you've got you to gotta look at all those aspects. And he's making brands out of fighters who 
under any other promoter probably won't be brands that be just lower league fighters that you know the likes of Conor Ben is almost like sold him as being a world class fighter and he's probably domestic level at best so he's done a fantastic job hasn't he because he's made platform. he's made people believe that Conor Ben is a, is the heir apparent to Crawford and Spence so that's oh. isn't that what promote isn't that what promoter does what would Michael McKinson do to him probably shut him out I, I couldn't see Conor Ben landing much on McKinson and McKinson's shown he's got good whiskers he'd 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 shut him out he'd just dominate him he wouldn't stop him because he's not a puncher but he'd just dominate him 12 rounds out of 12 and yeah. stand him on his head but you know I guess it's what's the job of a promoter um, Russell everyone's got a different opinion haven't they we want to see 50-50 fights but then you've also got the flip side of it is you want to make as much money for your fighters as possible and keep them as safe as possible and, you know, get them out of the game with something still left between their ears. So um, I've got to say Eddie Hearn's the best promoter in the UK. What about Dennis Hobson's 16 shows last year? It's good volume, isn't it? It's, it's, it's like the Steve Woods thing, isn't it? It's, I think Steve might have done about 30 or something, but it's really, really good volume and Dennis is again he's a hard working servant to boxing but I think Dennis and Steve one of the jobs that they do as well is they're almost like feeders aren't they because they've got these kids who they put them on the local shows and because the, they're not kids who are GB kids who are signing generally they're not signing kids who have got really high profiles yeah. and they keep them ticking over they keep them matched nice and safely and then they feed them and then they start to feed them through to the you know, to the matchroom shows and to the Queensbury shows. So they're doing the job, but you have to feel sorry for them then when, you know, the likes of, you know, Warrington then becomes a matchroom fighter and you don't hear much about Steve Wood, do you? No. But ultimately, it's Steve Wood and it's and Sean as well who kind of got into that position. But yeah, I don't repeat myself, but it's, it's what's, the, what's the job of a promoter? And that's to sell an event. Sell, sell an event, keep the fighters earning, keep the wheels turning, keep the viewers happy. As we've said before, you're never going to keep you and I completely happy because, you know, we, we like to think we're aficionados, but generally the casuals are just loving the stuff that Eddie's serving up. So he's doing his job. It's like an X factor. They're, they're doing the job, aren't they? They're getting the viewers. Yeah, okay. Uh, where do you think Dylan White's B sample is after 919 days? <laughs> that's a good that's a great question um has it gone missing missing in the post with dhl i don't i don't know it just it's very convenient for these things to just disappear isn't it yeah. and you know i'm not saying that that white is uh juicing again because i've done it before i'm not saying that white's juicing i'm just saying <sighs> It's he's had a two-year ban on it for juicing white. Oh yeah, yeah. That that that's the thing is, but again, to for balance, he's not the only heavyweight right now. He's not the only top-level heavyweight who's who's had a pat, you know, a performance enhancing drugs or uh, mm. some people say some of them out. But a banned substance um, positive test is not the only one. There are there are a few of them out there, out there. But there are other people out there that people just don't talk about. But. I, I'd like to see the B sample. I'd like to hear what's happened to it. Um, but you, you, it's not, it just goes away, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. I always think, I know, I know that there was an A and a B sample positive test for Canelo Alvarez, and I always talk about this. It's blasphemy when you bring up Alvarez and uh, the fact that he's a drugs cheat, the number one draw in the sport. But I always remember what Adam Smith said when um, Canelo Alvarez, and I've jumped a little bit, he, he fought Rocky Fielding. And he made a comment and he says, you know, Canelo Alvarez, you know, he's tested positive for drugs, but that's all in the past now. This is now. And I'm just like, fucking hell, it was about 12 months ago. And it's just like, it just gets, it gets washed out, washed away, doesn't it? It gets whitewashed. And if, you, if you're going to do really, really stringent VADA testing on all the top athletes and give them life bans, you wouldn't have any top athletes in boxing. It just, you just, you You'd have thirty four percent of the top fighters wouldn't, wouldn't be boxing. Yeah, it's it's convenient not to have stringent drug testing. It's as simple as that. I agree. I agree. Uh, B 
Ben, Billum, Smith and McGregor have all been kicked out at WBC rankings for not enrolling in the uh, safe, clean programme. What do you think to that? All I can talk about is, is myself and the boxers who I have trained. I can only talk about you know my principles and, and the fighters I've worked with's principles. And if my fighter had to enroll in such a program, he would enroll in that program or he wouldn't be working with me. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that. You, you just enroll in it, just do it. You know, no one's saying anybody's guilty. What we're saying is it's it's a really good thing. These programs are a really good thing. I know WBC is as dodgy as the rest of them, but it's a really positive thing to do is to enroll in these VADA programs. Just do it. It's a little bit like, um, what was it called? Mo Farah, who wasn't available for one of his tests, was he? It's like, no. make yourself available. You're professional athletes. You're supposed to be in the gym all the time, not on holiday. Also. So why can't you make yourself available for these things? Yeah. I, my fighters would do. You take a test or you fuck off and you find another gym. Simple as that. Yeah. Well, Eddie Hearn's just come out and said, oh, it's just a clerical mistake. And Conor Ben, Chris Bill and Smith, Lee McGregor, all they did was forget to fill a piece of paper and that's all. But wouldn't the teams behind these people be dealing with all that? Because I, I, I'm led to believe that's what happened. Well, you would, think, you would think so, wouldn't you? I mean, generally that type of thing I would have thought would come through the management. You know, it wouldn't come through the agents. It would come through the, the fighters' manager to deal with all those things because fighters are slack. You know, I will, I will defend the, the five fighters you just mentioned. They're, they're slack as hell. They need someone to tell them what to do and when to do it. You know, Sykes was just the same. I had to wipe his nose for him. But somebody should be made aware of this. And I don't believe it's just a case of, well, we tried to ring you, but you didn't, you didn't answer the phone. So there you go. You've been, you've been dropped from the rankings. There's got to be a little bit more to it than just a clerical error. You make yourself available for drug testing. It's the, the number one problem in professional boxing right now is performance enhancing drugs. It's dirty and it needs stamping out. And at some point, we all know this, someone is going to get killed in a ring and their opponent, their opponent is going to test positive for a banned substance and then the sport will be, they'll just be, they'll be shamed. It'll be horrendous. They'll go underground, won't it? It's got the people have got to look at this stuff. I just don't understand it. You know, um, it's trying to get my head around why you wouldn't make yourself available. If it genuinely is a clerical error, you know, maybe some emails not being picked. Maybe they've got, you know, what, three of them. And that's what I'm saying. But I don't know. I'm trying. I'm trying to give the benefit of the doubt to the fighters and think. Well, what's a clerical error? Has someone not responded to an email? Are they not being phoned up? Have the contact details been are they incorrect? But these fighters aren't hard to get hold of, are they? Connor Ben wouldn't be hard to get hold of because he's one of the most highest profile fighters in the country. So it's not good enough, Russell. It's not good enough, mate. It's, it's not good enough. The sport is dirty. We're not calling out in specific individuals. We're saying the sport is dirty. We've just covered that there are some of the top heavyweights who have tested the number one draw in boxing. As tested three, four years ago, Alvarez, he was given a pathetic 12-month ban. He only boxed twice a year anyway. And then he was rewarded with a massive contract with DAZN. It's not good enough. It's not a level playing field. And, you know, you hear people as well. I've heard people say, well, why don't you just let people take what they want and then you've got a level playing field? It's just a struggle like that. You, you can't have this superhuman strength. That's not exaggerating, by the way. You only, I mean... The best thing to look at is the fact that we have Mr. Universe and Mr. Olympia, and then they have a Mr. Natural Universe, Mr. Natural World, you know, etc. So it's almost saying that we know that the guys in, if you look at the strength of a Ronnie Coleman or those guys, those guys have got superhuman strength. So you transfer that across to a boxing ring. You've seen those, those fighters, those eight ounce gloves, those 10 ounce gloves, and those, those, the way they wrap their hands now, are like absolute, they're like clubs. And then you and then you're putting peds into somebody and then they're hitting people repeatedly in the head. Are we, are, you, are we kidding? Is this where we're heading? We've said before, we said in the last last time we chatted, boxing's a real dangerous sport. 
but let's make it as safe as we can. And the best way to make it safe is to reduce the sparring, as we've said, not have as many mismatches, get fighters out of the sport who are not competent, and get drugs cheats out for life. Get them out for life. No Give 12 months tickets. Get them out for life. You can't have drugs cheats in boxing. Yeah. Tony Bellio wants to stone them unless it's somebody he knows. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't stone a drugs cheat. Um, <laughs> I, I, like I said, it's I'd ban them from the sport if someone's, if someone's, you know, clean, clearly taken performing enhancing drugs and it's not eating, you know, horse meat or whatever, all this rubbish. Or was it something like Canelo Alvarez? I said it's about about fifty horses for the amount of glenbutrol that was found in his system. So yeah. clearly, clearly, it was on a cycle, wasn't it? It was on a glenbutrol cycle, but. Get them out. Get them out of the spot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Khan Brook, it's got a rematch clause. It's come out yesterday. What do you think to that? I didn't know that, Russell. You'll, you'll probably find some of the things that you're saying to me at the moment. Um, can you hear that dog barking in the background? Yeah. Oh, so oh, oh, oh. Give him a doggy chocolate, uh, Julian. Draghi, you don't have rock. Sorry about that, everybody. Members and guests and everybody's apologies. Um, people come to the house and then they park in the drive before they come in, sat on the phones for 10 minutes. It's like, just get off your phone. Right. Um, carry on, Russell. Card Brooks got a rematch clause. You see, I didn't, I didn't know that um, because I'm not on social media as often as I used to be. The, the most social media I'm on now is with you, is YouTube. And generally, as I've said before, I came off Instagram, came off Facebook, Twitter, all this stuff. It just does my head in. So I don't always catch up on the news. And then mentioning that, I'm thinking it's bad enough that we have to watch it once. Who wants to watch it twice? And could, could those guys go through? You know, the bodies are falling to pieces. Could those guys go through two training camps back to back? I, I don't know. And I always think when you have a rematch clause built in, first of all, I think why? You know, what's the reason for the rematch the rematch clause? What 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 are you what are you gonna do? Are you there's no belt on line, is there? It's just it's two pensions, isn't it, for them? Yeah, and that's that's what I don't understand. It's like, you know, if you get beat, if you, you fight and you get beat. You've lost. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And the rematch clause, I always, I never quite understand. It's like the uh, the Wilder and Fury fight. I know the third fight was, you know, it was um, a, a thrilling fight. But the second Fury and Wilder fight was one of the most brutal one-sided beatings that you could ever watch. But yet there was a rematch clause. What, why would you have a rematch clause? It, you know, if, if a fight so so clearly one-sided... Why would you bother having a rematch clause? They want to get two bites at cherry, don't they? They do, and it all. It all I also wonder then, and I'm, I'm not shouting fix, but I, my mind starts ticking, and I think, what, what's the agreement here? What, what's the agreement for the first fight? Are we going to have a bit of a spar, and we're going to have a bit of a close first fight? Is it on the level? And I do ask myself if it if it's on the level. I understand a, a champion. I understand when you've got a champion defending his belt and giving having a voluntary defence. I understand if he's if he has a rematch clause, if it's short notice or whatever. I get that. I don't understand rematch clauses for mandatories because if you're a mandatory challenger, you've earned that shot. You deserve that shot. Yeah. So why do you have to fight the fighter twice? And I just don't like it. Um, I, I believe in if you fight for a title, for example, like Marvin Hagler had several rematches, but the guys he beat in the first instance, so Hampshire, for example, those guys had to work their way back up. Yeah. It's just queue jump. It's just queue jumping. It's just pushing everybody out. And I'm not big on rematches. All right, so you don't, you're not happy with that one then, because there's no belt on. They're not a world title, is it? I, I just don't understand it. I'm, I'm not being deliberately dense here. I don't understand why you'd. You know, we said finally we've got Carnan Brook after all these years. You know, 
let's just find out who's the best. Are we not sure that we're going to find out who's the best in the first fight? So we're going to have a, a, re, a rematch clause. Are we going to have a three-fight deal? Is that because, something, yeah, because it could end up a trilogy, couldn't it? Yeah. See, you see, I never understood as well when they announced the Fury and Joshua fight and there was saying it's a two-fight deal. It's a two-fight deal. I mean, for my money, that was Tyson Fury would have just slapped Anthony Joshua silly. So how do you sell the second fight? It's a little bit like the uh, the Usek and Joshua fight. Us Usek, I mean, I know we're talking managers, but Usek was a manager challenger. So why does Joshua get another bite? It's, it's, Usyk's earned his right. It was mandatory. Yeah. He's, he's beat Joshua. He's beat him easily. Yeah. He's absolutely systematically just broke him down. He almost took him out in the last round. Why doesn't somebody else get a shot? Why doesn't Joe Joyce get a shot? Why are these guys with these, these big names? And as we've talked about before, it's just a popularity contest. They're tying up these belts and other people are just not getting their opportunity. Either. Joe Joyce is going to be 90 years old before he gets an opportunity at the world title. It's ridiculous. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to heavyweight division later on in the episode. What do you think to the current situation between Warrington, Martinez, Lara and Galahad? It's a bit of a merry-go-round, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, we won't cover the... The uh, the testing thing, but wasn't Lara one of those people actually? Who yeah, he was one of them the... people that's not signed up for WBC testing program. I have, to, you know, I have to be careful what I say, but I I always wonder as well when I see a fighter like Lara when he absolutely walked through Josh Warrington like he was not even there the first time. You know, when a fighter comes from nowhere and he has a kind of he doesn't have a you know a, a great record and he's no big names on his record whatsoever. And then he steps in and he just absolutely wipes out a world champion. I, I always wonder about those those fights, if I'm being completely honest. But that, sorry, that's back on the drugs thing. But, I mean, you have to feel for Kid Galad. Again, um, if he has a... Talking rematch, is that way? If Galahad had a guaranteed rematch, yeah. you've got to ask, what, what was the stipulation in that contract? Was it an immediate rematch? Was well, we don't know, do we? But it, Eddie could have quite easily sat him down and said, "Look, I've lost a fortune on the Sheffield show. You don't do tickets because you're not exciting your style, and you've just been wiped out. So I'm going to put Warrington in with Martinez, and you'll get the winner. But Warrington won't fight Garrett again. No, and what and why would you? I mean, it wasn't the best fight in the world, was it? It was a no, because he comes to spoil, doesn't he? And Josh Dunn does he? So I don't think they'll fight again. So. Where Galahad goes now, I don't know. He's in wilderness. He'll have to get mandatory route, won't he? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, how old is Galahad now? He's no spring he's chicken. Odd, isn't he? Has he had step aside? We don't know if he's been kept sweet because he's very quiet and not vocal, is he? No, he's Whereas not. Whereas when Warrington beat him, we're squealing like a pig for a rematch. Now I think he's he probably got just... the contract for a rematch. He's silent. Well, Galahad would be so glad to be on such a platform anyway because, you know, he doesn't even sell out in his own town, does he? So it's one of those... Yeah. It's one of those things, I guess, sometimes when you're not, you know, a promoter's dream and you're not a, like a really high profile fighter, it's almost like you're eating what's on your plate. And he must be happy with the deal because him and Dom Ingle are not coming out and shouting and raising hell. Everybody just seems really happy with the situation. Yeah. We'll put Josh, we'll put Josh in with Martinez again and let's see what happens. Um, it's, it's just, it's just the, the, the state of the sport. From, from Josh Warrington's point of view, that's a good fight. Yeah. It's a, an opportunity to get his belt back. It's against somebody he's beaten already once before. It was a good fight, actually. It was a it was a close fight. I thought Josh won it, but maybe two or three points. But it was a close fight. But you've also got the added drama that Martinez now would be on a high. You know, Josh hasn't won in his last two fights. Yeah. No matter what happens, his confidence can't be that high. You know, he's... So he hasn't won in his last two fights. You know, in his last four fights, he had a close fight with Galahad. Then he had, obviously, the, the, the knockout. And then he's had two fights without a win. One of them was a bad loss. Martinez, I thought, really was robbed against Zelfa Barrett. So he's having almost like a good end to his career. He's having the Indian summer, as uh, Adam Smith would call it. And he'll be on a high now. He'll be as confident as hell. So what was probably... Any other time a 70-30 fight in Warrington's favour, that might be a 50-50 fight right now. 
Yeah, who have you got to win that, Martinez or Warrington? I think, I, I suspect that Josh will just box. I think he'll just go, he can box. I've seen him first hand in the gym so many times. I think he'll go back to just boxing, keep it on the outside. Believe me, he really can box. And I, I think he'll probably win on points. I think Josh will probably beat him again, three, four round margin. I, I just think he's just a little bit more rounded than Martinez, but the confidence will be with Martinez, that absolutely. But, you know, before the Galahad knockout, Galahad was, I wouldn't say was doing a number on him, but he looked to be in stages dominating. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 well, all, all, all Galahad were in stages dominating. Yeah, I thought he would win it. Yeah, he was. He, he was, yeah. So Martinez, there were just times in that, in that fight, Martinez was looking his age, wasn't he? He was looking... Like he was just going to get well beat on points, and then he just landed those massive shots, didn't he? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Terry Harper lost a WBC world title fight to Boom Song, or Boom. Oh, sorry, Boom Garden. Sorry, Boom Song. He's a footballer, isn't he? <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you, mate. I don't watch football. Well, is a uh, is a uh, she's uh, lost the belt, WBC belt, which they said was best belt in boxing. She got a rematch clause. And she wants to be in tough fights, Eddie Hearn just said. But she's now fighting Heather Hardy, who's 40 year old, and she's got four stoppages out of 24 fights. So she's obviously a feather duster woman, isn't she? I mean, listen, it's... Terry's 25, I mean, Heather Hardy's 40. That's a 15-year swing, isn't it? I've got a lot of issues with that fight. Listen, you want you want to bring someone back after a bad a bad defeat. I understand it. OK, yeah. if you bring if you're bringing her back at lightweight, bring her back against the lightweight, first of all, you know, because all we're going to hear after this fight is she's so much more comfortable at the weight. She's hitting harder. She's looking great. As you would say, faster than a speeding bullet. She's actually fighting somebody who was a super bantamweight. Yeah. And then and then has boxed at featherweight quite recently. And who basically has got a, what, four KOs in 20, 24 fights. She's fighting a super bantamweight. So, first of all, that's not going to help her because she's not going to know what it's like to be in against a lightweight in the ring. She's not going to be in with someone who's physical. It's really horrific matchmaking, actually. And she's it, listen, potty. Yeah. Give her an easier... I'm not saying give Terry Harper an hard fight. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. But is that the best she can do? So, I've just been saying that Eddie Hearn's probably the best promoter in the country. And I'm going to contradict it by saying, is that the best you can do for, for you know, matchmaking? It's horrendous matchmaking. The woman is not far off drawing her old age pension and she's not even at the weight. She's not moved up one weight division, she's moved up three. And she couldn't even knock people out at super bantam weight. So what really is she going to do with Terry Harper? It's, it's an awful fight, awful. But the, Eddie's saying that it's squeaky bum time for Terry Harper and these are the fights she wants to be in and Steffi Ball wants her in these tough fights. Well, why didn't they take that world title rematch for WBC, best belt? See, this is one of the problems, and I have to be careful how I say this because I, I, I don't mean to offend, you know, disrespect women's boxing, some fantastic um, women women's boxing and some women's boxers coming through, but... What happens is because the talent pool is so shallow, you have someone like Heather Hardy, who's what is she, 22 and two or something, 24 and two? 22. On paper, that looks a respect that looks a respectable record, doesn't it? Well, yeah, but if you look at it. On paper, break it down, look at who she's been beating. And these are just the white collar fight. They're not even white collar fighters who she's been beating. So there, there are there are female boxers out there who have records on paper that look great. So what, what Eddie will do is he'll flash up the fact that she's done this, she's been in with a world champion and she gave her a good fight and she's, she's this, she's that, she's the other. She's old, she's got no power, she's weak and she's a blown up super bantamweight. Stop being silly, it's a really poor fight. There's better fights out there. Don't say these are the kind of fights that she, we have to give her and she's asking for these kind of fights. What is she asking for? Knockover jobs. I bring her back, but don't bring her back against this 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 girl because you know what's coming. It's already written. Okay. She'll she'll dominate this girl. She'll probably get her out there after five or six rounds. And we'll have to listen to the screaming banshees at ringside saying how she's looking super strong. 
but lightweight. Well, at least put it against the lightweight. It's, it's awful. Yeah, it's, it's bad matchmaking, but what would up with the Natasha Jonas fight? Or that rematch in that girl that they had a contract for? I mean, they've got a contract, right? If you lose, we've got a rematch. They must have said yeah at the beginning to sign. So they sign for the deal, Terry Harper and this boom song. She loses by knockout, but you've got a rematch. And they've not gone down that way. Wait, Root, I can't believe it. There's a belt there, a well, the WBC belt waiting for you. If you lose, we'll bring you back anyway. We'll bring you back anyway because you lost to a really good operator who was a quality operator who was, you know, she, she looked class, didn't she? And then we can use the weight as an excuse because, well, let's move you up to lightweight. But it just, I mean, the best lightweight at the world is um, Katie Taylor. Taylor. So where does where does she have a look in against? I know Katie Taylor might be slightly on the slide. She looked it last time, but she's Katie Taylor's like ten levels above Terry Harper. So what are you? What route are you going down? You don't drop down from a world title to then just start knocking about domestically, do you? No. I I assume that she wants big fights. So the big fight at that way would be Katie Taylor. Well, that's not a good fight for her. That's going to finish her career. Yeah. Katie Taylor would absolutely trounce her. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't even be a fight. I know. All right. Yeah. Uh... Let's have a look what we've got in Porky's bag of tricks. Uh... I saw some on YouTube on a YouTube channel called The YB, and he seems to be going on about uh, that Canelo. And, and Tommy Fury's in talks. Now, I don't believe it for one minute because people just invent stuff on some of these channels where they're behind the camera. So I don't believe that, that for one minute. But would you put it past people in the boxing industry putting rumours out like that or even wanting to make fights like that with way boxing is going at the moment? You know, we've been a bit of a circus. I remember you saying to you, Quite a while ago, I think when I first started coming on your your show, Russell, and I was talking about name association, you're linking fighters with well-known either celebrities or well-known fighters doing it all the time. What Tommy Fury needs to do is to learn his trade, mm -hmm. is to box every two months, gradually step up his op opposition, fight for domestic titles, etc., etc. If you're serious, you wouldn't have been fighting Jake Paul. You know, I'm not saying Tommy Fury's put put his name put his name out by the way with Canelo, but why are people talking shit all the time like this? It's like there's we've already established that Tommy Fury didn't have much of an amateur career. Yeah. So the one thing that he needs is he needs development. He needs development in the gym, development in the ring. Are you just gonna go around looking for the highest paid fights that you can get? Is it about money, or do you want to be the best at, at boxing that you can be? What what is Tommy Fury in boxing for? And I think that per, it's my personal opinion. It's not a it, it, first of all before I go into detail. What I've seen of Tommy Fury online, he seems a really nice kid. Yeah, it he just comes across as such a, a lovely guy. Um, he's very quiet actually. I think he's all he's in a very difficult position, isn't it, because of the name that he's got, and obviously you know. Tyson Fury is the biggest, baddest in the world. So he's in a really difficult situation. And I always wonder with Tommy Fury, if his heart's really in professional boxing, if he yeah. truly wants to, because words are one thing, but actions are another. Does he truly want to be the best fighter that he can be? Or has he been almost like feel obliged to do it because he carries a Fury name? Mm. Um, I mean, he was on a, a reality TV program, wasn't he? So being well-known is obviously important to him or else he wouldn't have gone on to something... I don't know what it was. Was it Love Love Island or something? I, I don't I don't follow that kind of stuff, but I, I, I'm aware that it was a reality TV star. Is that important to you? Or is being a really good fighter important to you? And for me, it's all about the development of fighters. I think that's the most important thing. And I want to see Tommy Fury fight. Obviously, this, he's injured at the moment, but I want to see him out all the time. And you know what? I heard something that it was... I don't know if it's true or not, and Frank Warren wouldn't pay that. Frank Warren would say it's absolutely nonsense, but someone said he was wanting like 250 grand a fight or something. Listen, I don't care who you are. If you're in four rounders on the lower end of bills, you're on four grand max, mate, if you're lucky. 
get out there. Don't worry about the money. If you're good enough, the money will come. If you're good enough, the fame will come. But you've got to be, you've got to develop fighters, and the only way you develop them is in the gym and in the ring. Where is Tommy Fury now? What is he doing? Well, he's at, he's nearly got 1.5 million for Jake Paul. He's now parked up, and he's not going to go wanting to fight the chicken for you now. So he's in no man's land, isn't he? Well, he needs to fight for three or four grand because it just doesn't matter. Because I know kids like, and I don't know the the exact purses, but I've been around the game long enough to know what fighters get paid. It depends on if you're a GB kid. If you're a GB kid on a TV show, you might start out 1,500 quid a round or something like that, okay? So you might get nine grand for a six round. But that's if you're GB. You know, if you're a, a, a good amateur and you've won, won the ABAs, you might get you might get 1,500, sorry, you might get 750 pound a round or something. It's not massive money at that level. So I know a, a lad from Dewsby. I'm from Dewsby. There's a really good amateur who fights on Frank, Frank Warren shows called Amar Akbar. Really good kid. Um, he was number one seed in the ABAs. He's, 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 I think he's working with Pat, Pat Barrett, actually. He's a really talented kid. I don't speak to Amar. I haven't seen him for a while, but he won't be earning massive money. Why the fuck should he earn so much less than Tommy Fury? He's, he's so much better than Tommy Fury. He's a really, really good kid. He won't be earning that much money, Russell, on these on these Queensbury shows. I'm not, I don't know the details, but he'd be lucky to get four grand. Why, yeah, why more than that, because he does loads of tickets, doesn't he? Well, he might do loads of tickets, but it's not massive money. Honestly, by, by the time you slice it down, and, you know, it's not massive money. These guys are earning great money early on, and I, and I just struggle with the fact that what is Tommy Fury in boxing for? Because actions are one thing, words are another, but ultimately you're going to you're going to be judged on your results, aren't you? And you're going to be judged on your activity. Mm. And I'm not seeing it right now. I mean, you know, he's had five fights. What's he had? Six fights? I think he's seven and now. He's not stepped up a level yet, has he? I mean, the, the last fight... Not anybody with a win, has he, yeah? I've told a few, no, it's, not even had a win. It's it's dreadful, really, isn't it? And you know what? He might be really talented. He might be one for the future. I don't know. I, I need to see him in... Not not 50-50 fights at this stage. You, you want to see him in an 80-20 fight, but you need to see him in something a bit more taxing. Or we just need to see him, but he's, he's, in, he's in the news or he's on social media. You know, I don't watch it often, but... All I hear about is he's on social media every single day. Is that what you, is that what you are? Is social media more important than development? You know, I've I've worked in the gyms where there's been the likes of Tyrone Nurse. You know, Tyrone Nurse was a brilliant fighter. You know, British champion, um, lightweight British lightweight champion. Chris Aston was his trainer and his dad, his manager. Tyrone Nurse was in the gym every night. By the time he was like 20 year old, he'd had about 10, 15 pro fights. He turned over 18. He was fighting all the time. And he was developing all the time and he was sparring with really good kids. That's development. I'm not seeing the development with, with, with Tommy Fury. He looks really stiff. He looks really upright. Come on, just are you a fighter or are you, are you just a celebrity? What, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, answers on a postcard. To porky corner at mail.com. Yeah. And I'm not knocking him because I, I'm not just saying it, by the way, because what I've seen of him, I like him. I think he's. I've known him since you were 14. He's a nice lad, actually. I bet he is a nice lad. It wouldn't surprise me whatsoever. Um, and I, I almost felt sorry for him with the Jake Paul thing. It was, I don't even know why he was chasing that fight. And then obviously the, inju the injuries, he looked really bad, didn't he? He looked like he just didn't want to fight. And I felt really sorry for him because he shouldn't have been put in that position. He should have had the dignity to say, like Tyson Fury, like Tyson Fury wouldn't have been fighting, you know, celebrities and YouTubers on the way up. Tyson Fury was, he was busy and he was fighting the best domestically and then he stepped up. He was a real fighter and he had a real fighter's path. So why has Tommy Fury gone down this road, this road career-wise? It's absolutely insane. He needs to bring him back down to earth and he needs to get in the gym, he needs to get in the ring and we need to see him all the time to decide whether he's good enough or not. And he might well be good enough, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, but you know, don't you? you know it's going to be a wasted career. You know it's going to go nowhere. I know he's only oh. a kid and he's young, but it's not going to go anywhere. You you know that because it's it's so conflicting what the direction is with his career. Yeah, uh, Dazone put something out, and that Tony Bell you were on pads in ring in Liverpool, and Dazone put something out. 
potential comeback, aren't we? And all this. If Tony Bellew does come back, it'll be ever, obviously at heavyweight. But who does Tony fight if he comes back? I, I always think about these things, and there's without going into too much detail, but there's obviously the, the consumer or there's the boxing fans view who Tony Bellew yeah. would fight, who Tony Bellew should fight. Will he, will he fight again? I, I, I said about a year ago, I thought he would do. I, I, I can't remember who I was talking to. It might have been my mate Stuart. And I said, I think Bellew will fight again. Um, it purely would be a financial exercise, by the way. So mm-hmm. it'd have to be somebody. They'll have to start some beef with somebody in the in the game, won't they? Just to get a little bit of a little bit needle. Speed. No, yeah, they'll pick, they'll pick, they'll pick someone out. I understand, by the way, if Bellew comes back, why he would be doing it, and I'll and I'll try and explain. As I say, as consumers, as boxing fans, we view it as a sport. We want to see the most competitive fights out there. Tony Bellew, he, what is he? Thirty-five? I don't, I don't know. Thirty-five. He's older than that, isn't he? What, 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 I, what I wouldn't know, but well, I get, effectively, what I'm saying is, is athletes. Athletes have a, a limited shelf life, don't they? And once they're retired, unlike you know, myself, unlike me, and unlike you, and unlike everybody else, I might be working until I'm until I'm old and 60, 70, 80, who knows? But I've got a kind of a you know, you live modestly, don't you? When you're Tony Bell, you he might he might have no idea, by the way, Tony. So I apologize if I'm talking about your finances, but he might have four or five million tucked away. When you live like these guys live, it doesn't last forever. Yeah, you know they have huge houses, they have expensive cars, big properties, all these kinds of things. Tony Bellew probably has a window, and if that window means he can earn another three or four million, while he's very he's still a big name, he's still people want to see Bellew, whether it's uh, on TV or reality TV programs or fighting, people still want to see Bellew. So from his point of view, why wouldn't he fight again if if he can do? have a, a couple of big fights and a shitload of money and pocket that away. He's going to do what he can do for his kids and his family. That's what he's going to do. And that's the difference, Russell, is we see it completely different. But I, you know, I think of like, like Josh Warrington, for example, he's got a little, couple of little kids, nice house, and, but it, money doesn't last forever. And people would say, Jules, you're talking shit, you know, that guy's worth five million. If I had five million, I'd never have to work again. Doesn't last as long as you think when you live like they live. These guys don't live like we live. They don't live off 400 quid a week. They don't live like that. They, they live off, they live a different lifestyle. We can't imagine. So Tony Bellew, when he's 60, what is he going to do if he's short of money? You can't you can't make a comeback, can he? No. So it make it makes sense to me. It does make sense to me as a the viewer, because I don't want to see a past it Tony Bell you getting knocked out. Is his missus won't want to see that, but I'm, I, I Let's always see how old he is. Sorry, two seconds. I, I might be wrong. I might be wrong, Russell. He might be 36, he might be 35. I've got no idea. He looks well, whatever he is. 39. He's, he's in his 40. 30, well, 39. Wow. He's so, his, he's older. so he's in his 40 this year, right? Tony Bell, he was 40 this year. So oh, you're right, his window's going to go, isn't it? Yeah, his window's going to go. And it's like, who are we to tell a man they can't, we can't earn a living? We can just turn off if we don't want to watch it, can't we? We just don't pay for it. I, I understand why we get frustrated and we say, is, has boxing come to this? But, you know, throughout history, fighters have gone on way past their best. You know, it, it broke my heart when Larry Holmes came back and fought Mike Tyson. And then he got knocked out. He thought, at least Holmes is done now. And then he continued to come back, didn't he? He fought Ray Mercer and fought Oliver McCall. He ended up fighting bloody Butterbean, didn't he? And Larry Holmes isn't worried, isn't worried about fighting Butterbean when he's sat in East Pennsylvania in his, in his mansion. Because Bellew will be thinking, I know I'm going into the finances, but Tony Bellew, when he's a family man, you know, he's, he's clearly a family man, what he'll be thinking about is, do you know what? Eddie's lacking a few big names at the moment. I, I could have a couple of big fights. I could earn a shitload of money. And my kids don't really have to worry about their future right now. But what about my grandkids? What about my extended family? So it might not be the answer you expect, but I completely get why fighters continue if people are throwing the money at them. 
I, I understand it. It's like Amir Khan, isn't it? I mean, Amir Khan's very wealthy, but what's he getting for this fight? Six, seven million? Don't know. You're a long time retired when you're a fighter, mate. And um, I'm going to sound really offensive when I say these guys aren't brain surgeons, but y- you know what I mean, don't you? Mm. This is, for us, we think, you know, professional fighters, I always remember the, the line that Steve Farhood said. It was the KO Magazine um, editor a few years ago. And Steve Farhood said there were professional fighters and everybody else. But it was a really, a really good quote. And ultimately, pro fighters don't look at it like we do. So we would think, why would you get punched in the head for two million? Why would you come back past your best, Tony? Put yourself through a training camp and, and risk getting knocked out for two million. Tony Bellew getting getting chinned. Pro fighters getting hit in the face. It's fuck all to them. It doesn't bother them. They're not regular people. It just doesn't bother them, mate. So why, if he thinks he can get away with it, he'll do it. People listening to me now might think, well, you, it's, it's, it's embarrassing to boxing. Tony Bellew coming back isn't embarrassing as some of the things we're seeing in boxing right now. Evander Holyfield at, 40, at 57 years old, getting stopped in the first round by an MMA fighter, that's embarrassing. Mm. That, that's awful. Tony Bellew in a 50-50 fight with a big WWE type build up on the zone and everybody creaming themselves. Yeah. It's just business as usual, isn't it? Everybody creaming this. Yeah. All right then. Well, so do you want to see Tony come back? Listen, I've I've, I've had this conversation with him before. I know Tony gets a bit of stick on on your channel. I've always liked him from a personal point of view. I like him. Um, I like what he stands for, but I always remember him from when Gary Sykes' days. I didn't know him well. I wouldn't pretend to know him well because I don't. Um, but I've had a couple of very brief conversations with him. But I always remember, and I'm not doing the Tony Bellew plug, or if I am, it's the first ever Tony Bellew plug on Porky's Corner. So get ready for it. But there was a little, he used to be on Twitter years and years and years ago, you know, when he, before he became that well known as he is now. And I always remember some kid got his bicycle nicked at Christmas and Bellew was tweeting it all over and he kind of got the money together to make this kid's Christmas and stuff. And I always rated that. I thought that's such a good thing to do. And I don't think he was doing it for publicity. I think he was just, you know, some some kid who was who would live quite close to him had been robbed basically at Christmas. And I thought it was such a nice thing to do. Maybe I've been taken in, but I've seen him do things like that on on I've heard about little things about Bellew, about looking out for people. And and I actually think he's a decent bloke, mate. I know it's not <laughs> Everybody's view, but I, I think he's a decent bloke. Yeah. All right, then, mate. A personal view, mate. I like him. Well, I'm over fucking well by your decency. You, Tony you're Bell. gutted, aren't you, mate? You, <laughs> I, know, I know you're gutted, but listen, I said to you, I'll always be diplomatic, but I'll always be honest with you. Yeah. So, I like Tony Bell, you mate. I always have, and I'll always root for him in a fight. All right, good man. There you go. That's gone down like a fucking lead balloon, mate. Hasn't fucking it? hell, mate. You've just sunk your set on here, Julian. Now, you know, oh, fucking, listen, fucking... I know you get some stick on your channel, mate, but you can't have a one sided view all the time, can you? It's like, no. well, I don't want to see Tony Bell you in a ring again. I'll tell you what, I want to see him at fucking food banks. <laughs> I did say I wanted to see him in a ring again. I said, if he comes back in a ring again, and he it's makes stuck a in a ring at moment, it, isn't it? And he fucking well, hurts. If if he if he comes back and earns some money, good for Tony Bellew. Would I, would I pay twenty quid? No, but I don't pay for all the pay per views anyway, mate. So I'm not tight. There's just certain ones I won't pay for. But I'm debating actually whether to pay for Khan and Brook. I'm having that battle with myself, and don't know. All right. Okay then. Sorry, uh, sorry Russell. You, the, this bit, by the way, anybody anybody who's watching won't even know I'm talking now because you're gonna cut a middle right out of this program, aren't you? <laughs> no, no, I'm not actually because uh, this is last video I'm doing. I'm not even going to split the video. This video is last time I've got on. If we're going to have justice for Gary Sykes, mate, we're going to have like justice for Tony Bell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, Tony Bell, you might be a nice guy, but how he conducts himself, he's not my cup of tea. He won't get through my front door, mate. So that's fair enough, mate. That's 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 absolutely fair enough. You know, if we all kind of like the same thing and the same personalities, be boring place, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, it would. That's what makes your channel really good because you're honest, you wear it on your sleeve, you say things that people agree with, although vehemently disagree with you. you 
you tend not to be in the middle. You know, it's one of those things. Um, I just like fighters to be fighters. You know, like, you know, Josh Whale, Liam Walshers, Carl Frotchers, you know, Gary Sykes. Oh, listen. Them sort of guys. Listen, I hate all this fucking throat slitting and throwing tables over and dressing up as Batman. I can't stand all this stuff. It's not it's not my cup of tea, but it's it's where we're at now, isn't it? You know, unfortunately it's where the sport is at. I, you know, my boxers were never like that. I don't I don't I don't love it, but it's where we are. And I guess they're doing the job out of promoting the show. It's what yeah. it's what Remember said to you, it's Quick plug. It's like I, I said this to you a while ago, Russell. It's like world titles, right? Yeah. I hate all these so-called organizational world titles, yeah. right? I'm the only one who does. Promoters love them, fighters love them, fans love them, managers love them, the organization love them, the British Board of Control love them. Everybody loves all this proliferation of world titles apart from me and apart from you. It's and it's the same with this theater that we get on these Dazone. And Sky shows, you know, like like an I'm going on a fucking tangent now. Like announcing fighters in the ring, announcing trainers in the ring. When did that start? When did we start announcing the coach? You know, oh that uh, what's what's here's so and so with his head trainer. You know, Shane yeah, McGuigan. In, in which uh, looks like him out of Thunderbirds. It were him, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, who started? I mean, I, I could go on forever. Who started announcing coaches in the ring? It's not about the trainer, it's about the fighter. When did that start? Let me just uh, say something on here. The other day, I said that Joe Gallagher has 61 uh, world champions. I said 61 world. I meant to say just champions across champions. the board. Somebody, is, it, is it Yimmy? You're having a little moan, want your own comment section? If you don't like it, Yimmy, fuck off. All right, you're not Listen, a fucking member anyway. And anybody oh. who's listening, anybody who's listening, and you told me about some of these emails that you get. Oh, right? fuck you know. I can't get my head around. Do you know what? It's like we've had people who you know, I've only been on your show a few times, but people disagree with what you say. People send you a shitty email. And like you say, come on and we'll have a debate about it. It's not. I don't want to come on to this one and hide behind the fucking comment section. After people want to. Yeah. yeah. And what I will say, like you've thrown some questions at me tonight, and I've stumbled on a few of them. I stumbled on the first one. We don't rehearse this, do we? We don't no. plan this. It's just basically just comes out. We just ad lib with, yeah. with various subjects. And even though you might start with a framework, it's quite organic. So if anybody thinks it's easy to just talk for an hour, come and have a go. Come and have a go. So if you're going to say Joe Gallagher's sixty odd world champions, no, no. Well, I, I meant to say champion. Yeah. It's a slip of the tongue, you know what I mean? Fucking hell, it's like... Yeah, a fucking life, you mean. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, right, what I will say is, I'm going to finish off on Fury versus White, Joshua versus Usa. What is happening and is there a solution? Because it's a fucking mess that we've got all these... Three of them are British, aren't these four... Joshua's got a rematch clause with Usyk. He's going. He looks like he's stalling on that. Uh, White's just fought for three hundred grand. He's been offered five point five million. He's asked for ten million, but yet it's mandatory. What the fuck's going on, Julian? Shower shite, mate. Listen, first of all, Dillian White and the money situation. My view, not shared by everybody, is Dillian, Dillian White can either have twenty percent of a lot of money or 100% of nothing. So that's up to him. I know which I'd go for. I mean, people, you know, I've heard Eddie Hearn saying he knows his worth and he's a big name. Who says he's a big name? What? Who, Dylan White? He's one of fucking vacant British, hasn't he? I don't think he's a big name. I think he's, a, he's one of the names that I know at heavyweight, but he's not exactly blown us all away. It was only two fights ago. He was stretched under the bottom rope by a 40-year-old guy. It's like, that's not criticising him. That's just a... In fact, Tyson Fury is the man, is the man, is the, is the number one fighter on the planet, the number one heavyweight on the planet. And he's, come on, never mind 60, 40, 70, 30. Just, do you know what? If you're so confident you're going to beat Fury, as I've said about Tommy Fury earlier, the money will come. Take the fight, beat Fury, unify, earn 100 million, do, do whatever. 
do you want to fight for the world title or not? You've already turned it down once. You turned down five and a half million Joshua at Wembley. I mean, I've never, you know, I've never heard of that. I've, I've genuinely, I've never heard of anybody turning down a shot at the world heavyweight title. I find it, I find it obscene. I find it just, you know, can you imagine what Jack Dempsey and Rocky Marciano and uh, Ezard Charles would have made of fighters turning down a shot? At the world heavyweight title, it's just it's just unheard of, isn't it? It just doesn't happen. So he's he's effectively turned the fight down before. And Again, now Joshua. Like yeah. So it seems like he's now pricing himself out of um, another title fight. So you want the, the fight, one. Do you not? The Fury yeah. one, Julian. Yeah, 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 yeah. It looks like he's pricing himself out of it. Just do you know what I'd take? You know, I've I've said this before. Like when Sykes was going to fight Adrian Broner, we was gifted that shot, it would have been brilliant for Gary, just to say he's fought for world title. But Sykes, were, Sykes wasn't even on like 5% of what Broner was on. It was a joke, but it's a chance at, you know, the, the heavyweight championship of the world, it's the richest prize in sport. Do these guys not know the, the history of the heavyweight heavyweight division? Do they not, do they not know about the, the, the likes of, you know, Corbett and Fitzsimmons and all these guys and Jack Dempsey and Marciano and Walcott and Charles and do, do they not have any kind of sense of nostalgia or any sense of pride? It's like he could get 20% of a very big number. Just take it. Is it about the fight? As I said with Fury, Tommy Fury, is it about the fight and being a fighter or is it about how much money you want to make? That, could you imagine Henry me, Cooper oh. knocking back Ali at Wembley? I can't, I just can't imagine it. It's like, I can't, I can't imagine like, like Larry Holmes, when Larry Holmes fought Jerry Cooney, that was a bizarre thing. Hope the champion got the same as a challenger. And Holmes was like, I don't care. I'm just going to take you out. I'm going to show I'm the baddest man on the planet. And Holmes got 10 million, Cooney got 10 million, unheard of, you know? And it's like, sometimes you have to just swallow your pride, don't you, to get the fight. Tyson's the biggest name in boxing, in heavyweight boxing. Just do what do what you need to do to get the fight. Worry about the training camp. Worry about your tactics. Worry about winning the fight, and everything else will come. But that's just me. That that's just well, it's not just me. That's I think that's what where you're coming from as well. But you can say this till you're blue in the face. What's the most important thing? What's the what's fight. the most important thing? getting the fight? Don't understand it because when I was in, you know, stuck record here goes again. But when I was just say, I'm the same age as you, Russell. When I was a kid, when I got into boxing, uh, I was about seven, eight year old. I remember listening to the fights on the radio. Larry Holmes was the heavyweight champion of the world. He'd, he'd just beaten Ken um, Norton. Yeah, he'd beaten Ken Norton. And then I used to watch um, World of Sport in the beginning. It used to show the clip when Shavers. The intro for World of Sport and Shavers dropped him with that overhand right, you know what shot. And you know, Holmes would defend his title every three months, and Holmes would fight for like 700 grand against the likes of Lorenzo Zan, and he wasn't getting massive money. And he just kept boxing, kept frequently fighting. And these fighters, some of these people fighting Larry Holmes were getting like, I know money's inflation, etc., but they were getting like 100 grand, 150 grand for fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world. As you've said, Henry Cooper and all these guys and Brian London, all these British fighters before us. Richard Dunn. They were, they were, Richard Dunn, they're getting fuck all. They were just getting peanuts for fighting Ali. But it's like, do you know what? I'm fighting Ali. I'm fighting for the heavyweight champion of the world. I'll be able to tell my grandkids I fought Muhammad Ali. Whereas Dillian White, what, what are you going to tell your grandkids? You didn't fight Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua because they weren't going to pay you enough. Mm. It makes no sense. Do you think that Eddie Hearn is trying to work a solution out whereas it's Dylan White, Joshua and Fury Usyk? Because he's, he's been mentioned, hasn't it, this week, what he was going on about. Do you think that's maybe the way forward? It gives Joshua an interim fight and it, it takes Fury away from Dylan White because Dylan White obviously do not want to fight him by asking for double money. So it, that means he do not want to fight, doesn't it, obviously? Of course he does. That's, that's all it can mean, yeah. And Joshua is not exactly forcing the Usyk rematches because he's got a rematch clause, but he hasn't enforced it yet, has he? We are dating that in a press conference. We haven't got a trainer yet, has he? Apparently. Um, 
Uh, Apparently, McCracken's gone, hasn't he? I think he's left. Yeah, so, so, we, so we don't know who his coach is, do we? So I I can't see... I mean, they were talking about April for the Usyk fight. I can't see that happening in April. Not, not no, I can't. And Tyson no. Fury said if he don't fight for end of Feb or something, he's going to sack his promotional team, doesn't he? Yeah, so he's going to get rid of Aram and Warren. I mean, I mean the, the, the craziest situation now is we've got two... The two big fights out there, you know, we've got Usek and Joshua rematch. It's a big fight. I don't, I don't think it's an amazing fight because I think it's another one-sided beating, but that's beside beside the point. At least we've got decent heavyweights fighting each other, and we've got Fury and Dillian White, and none of those, neither of those two fights have been confirmed. We don't have any dates for those fights, so we, you and I, might be having this conversation in May and June, saying, "So what's going to happen? What's going to happen?" It's, it's. The, the fight wants a flood, don't they? Um, well, what's the common denominator in both fights? Which promoter's dealing with both of them fights? Eddie Hearn. Eddie Hearn. Warren's not dealing with both. He's not to do with Joshua and Usyk, is he? Eddie's involved with both of them fights, and they are not happening, are they? And this no, is why Sky you... got rid of him, you know. Well, this this has always been... Uh, you know, I was started off by saying Eddie Hearn was the number one promoter in the, in the country, and I believe that. But if you just allow me a couple of minutes... To talk about Joshua and his yeah. talk, we're talking about talking about Tommy Fury. We're talking about the development of a boxer. Yeah. Now we keep hearing about AJ that he's got the L plates on and he's still a working pro. Now why is that? And I'll tell you exactly why AJ is still a working pro was because everybody knows that Eddie Hearn really was desperate for a piece of the heavyweight action. He wanted that so much. You know, Fury would have nothing to do with him. Mm. You know and. He was desperate for a piece of the heavyweight action. So when the opportunity came up for Charles Martin, he didn't think about the fighter's development. He didn't think, if I'm going to put jo put Joshua in with this, I mean, Charles Martin was garbage. So he knew that was a, a certain win. But what he didn't think about was the development, because once you're up at that level, you're at that level, aren't you? So Anthony Joshua should have been allowed to have three or four more you know, be knocking everybody out in one or two rounds. He should have been allowed to develop as a fighter. Mm. So Eddie Hearn's greed and Eddie Hearn's desire to have, even if it was just a slice of the pie at heavyweight, put Anthony Joshua into a situation where he was propelled to the elite of the heavyweight rankings. And he wasn't ready. He didn't have the tools for it. You could see yeah. he's missing massive tools. So I think they played Joshua so wrong. It almost went wrong against Klitschko. You know, the... We know the story there. And the guy's got so many missing parts to his game in terms of development. And part of that is because he might not have the tool set anyway. His footwork's you know, shocking, isn't it? His footwork's shocking. His, his, everything's shocking. His spine's upright and he's just a very powerful lad. But, you know, he's an athletic person. But, you know what I mean? He, he never got those tough 10 rounders in, did he? He never kind of... And that was Eddie Hearn's desire to have a piece of the heavyweight championship and that's what happens is what happens is you get he got into his first real fight with Klitschko and it, the only thing that won him that was the fact that Klitschko was at the stage of his career he was at and he couldn't, finish, year old. he couldn't finish the job in the sixth round could he oh. it wasn't because it wasn't because uh, Joshua did a Larry Holmes type comeback and came back roaring at the end of the sixth round he was one shot away from being taken out and it took him four more rounds to mount another assault before he got Klitschko out. Mm. So he was he didn't win that fight. Klitschko's age lost that fight. Yeah. And then he had a couple more fights, you know, the, the Tackums and the Parkers, where he tried to kind of get easy matches. But ultimately, as I've said before, once you get into a situation, then you've got those mandatories. So if Anthony Joshua's a working pro, if he's still got L plates on, it's because you haven't developed him right. You made him a shitload of money. Great promoter, what I said. You made him a shitload of money, but you haven't developed the fighter. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem you've got now with Anthony Anthony Joshua. He's not going to learn the things he needs to know when he fights Usyk again. I mean, can you imagine if he fights Fury? If he, if Joshua had fought Tyson Fury, I mean... Tyson Fury are bludgeoning him. He's a monster, isn't if, he? If, if, I genuinely believe Fury could... And I, I, and I genuinely believe this, that Fury could beat him with one hand. I honestly think he could. I think it could just beat him with the left hand. Orthodox, switching, you name it, he would absolutely just dominate Joshua beyond belief. And that's because he's learned his craft. 
So back back again, I'm obsessed in the development of fighters because once you're at that level, like Conor Ben, once you get to that level, you're at that level to stay, and it's dangerous. So if you look at Tyson Fury, Tyson Fury had that, those tough fights. He had those fights with McDermott, didn't he? Mm. You know, they, they were hard learning fights. Aimer, you know, he had to, oh, Aimer as he well. Had, that Chisora as well when they were young. Chisora, the first Chisora fight was a cracking fight. So Fury's had the gut check and he had the experience to draw back on where things got tough. But when things got tough for Anthony Joshua, he had no experience to fall back on. No, he wanted out of there, didn't he? Yeah. So Eddie Hearn's greed and Eddie Hearn's obsession with wanting a, a slice of the heavyweight pie has effectively now left Anthony Joshua. His career is not looking great. Yeah, his earning capacity is amazing. It's wonderful. He's, he's a shitload of money. But as I mentioned earlier, it's about money or it's about legacy because yeah. money gets spent. So ultimately, you have now Anthony Joshua might be one more defeat away from retirement. That's not an outlandish statement. No. That's, that's a realistic statement. So why is that? Maybe he would have never got if he'd been developed and had the tough fights. Maybe he wouldn't have come through the gut check and he wouldn't have earned all that money. That's, I understand the argument as well. But they've put him in a really difficult situation now. And he's in a situation where if he steps out of the Usyk fight, it doesn't look great. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't, I don't have. I don't think there's many fights left in, in AJ's career at all. I really don't. Oh, yeah. I think they've... I think they've Managed him brilliantly from an earning point of view, but in terms of developing him as a fighter, absolutely terrible job. Terrible yeah. job. Yeah, I agree. I know you think that. Does that blame Light McCracken, do you think, or is it Hearn? I think it's Hearn. You think it's Hearn, um, yeah? McCracken, I think fighters become so big and so wealthy that the trainer doesn't have the sway. It's not like, you know, a local fight. It's not like me telling Sykes we're going to do this, we're going to do that, or something else. Anthony Joshua was just over. He was a millionaire, wasn't he? The minute he won that Olympic gold medal, he was a millionaire. Yeah. He was a wealthy young man. So effectively, he'll do what the promoter wants him to do because it's it's just the nature of the game now. Um, you know, if if Robert McCracken's the boss, has he got Robert McCracken's permission to be going out working with all these other coaches? McCracken yeah. won't have had a say. McCracken will, will have been told, you've got Charles Martin, get him ready. Irrespective of if McCracken thinks he was ready or not. But that that is a fighter who was... The fact that he's not been developed effectively, he's not gone slowly early on in his career, it was so embarrassing, wasn't it? I mean, the way that Ruiz just walked through him, it was just... In, it was... He looked, he felt sorry for Anthony Joshua in that fight. You know, you remember when the referee was giving the count after that was it six he rounds? Several long counts, didn't he? It was he just looked, didn't he, like, what am I doing in here? And, and he was going back to the corner saying, What shot am I to throw? What shot am I to throw? It's like, have you ever heard a, a heavyweight champion of the world looking at his coach for like specific shots? Hey, what, what do I do? I? Larry Holmes saying to Eddie Futch, What do I do? Ernie Shaves had knocked me down. Well, yeah. Holmes had all that experience to draw back on. And and all that he had Rich Giacchetti, didn't he, Larry Holmes? That's right. He had, he had yeah, he had uh, Giacchetti, then he had time with Futch, but he had, it's that toolbox, isn't it? It's that experience. It's having those tough fights yeah. and knowing how to come through that. And it's, again, that word development. And AJ's had no development. He, I'll go as far as to say, you know, when I see Anthony Joshua now on the pads, I mean, there was a, People say, what have you ever won, McGowan? You haven't won Olympic gold medal, but there was a, you know, we've all seen Joshua and Floyd Mayweather, haven't we? That video of him. Yeah. He's like, he's like shadow boxing, he's Anthony Joshua. And uh, my mate Stuart messaged me and he says, have you seen Joshua shadow boxing? I says, yeah, it looks like a white collar fight, doesn't he? You know, the, the head was in the air and the way he was throwing the right hand from the chest. And I'm like, Christ, how has he won an heavyweight title? It's, it's bizarre, actually. Um, he must be just so, such a strong natural athlete, mate. They were comparing him to Ali, Adam Smith, wasn't he? Bean. <laughs> his technique is is it's not great. His technique really isn't great. Um, I don't know if Usek is Usek's a, gr a good fighter, but I don't know if Usek's as good as Joshua made him look because 
he didn't have a clue, did he, how to how to navigate through any of those. Well, this is why I think they're worried about this rematch because they're not they don't seem to be moving forward with it, do they, Julian? No, I mean for me, I, I would probably it might be a tougher fight. I'd, I'd I'd pull him back and I'd have that conversation with him. I'd say, you know, because he's looking for that coach, isn't he? He's going around looking all the <clears> globe. <throat> to find that coach who's going to give him that, that special something. And they're all going to tell him what he wants to hear because they're all going to get very, very well paid. But I, I'd be sitting Anthony Joshua down, I'd be saying, right, AJ, what is it you want to do? Where, where are we going with this? What, what do you want to do? Do you want to, be a, do you want to have longevity? Do you want to get your belt back and keep hold of it? Yeah. Is that what we want to do? And if he says, I, I absolutely want to be number one, I'm a competitor, that's what I want to do. I'd be saying, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take two years out from the elite level. We're going to drop right down and we're going to, we're going to have a few 10 rounders. We're going to spend some time traveling the gyms. Let's be Tyson Fury's sparring partner. Ego won't allow none of this, by the way. This is me being Nirvana. This is me having Nirvana and just having that magic wand, I'd say. We're going to spend 12 months in Tyson Fury's camp. You can spend some time with the champ, the real champ. And you can learn off him. We'll get you some 10 rounders. We'll get you some tough, tougher fights. We might get you Ortiz, who's you know, is ancient, isn't he? He's a southpaw. Let's let's build up to Ortiz. Let's take two years out. Let's get you out four or five times a year. And then let's see that improvement. Let's see where you're at in 18 months. Let's see if that development's coming through. Because you cannot develop fighters in three or four months it's impossible it takes time and if Anthony Joshua would turn around to me and said that I really truly want to be number one I want to be back to where I am that'd be my path I'd, re I'd try and reinvent him like Buddy McGirt did with Arturio Gatti try and reinvent him but take him back to school and I always admired what Amir Khan did when Amir Khan got banged out by Prescott everyone was telling me he was the best he turned, he turned pro he was driving a 100 grand Range Rover an 18-year-old kid, he believed the hype, he got banged out, he got brutalised, and he dropped all the hangers on, and he went across to LA, and he was basically said to Freddie Roach, I want to start again, and Freddie Roach says, well, there you go, jump in with Manny Pacquiao, and by all accounts, Manny Pacquiao just pulverised him in a few sparring sessions, and that showed humility, but it also showed that Amir Khan wanted to learn, he knew he wasn't the finished article, he knew he'd got so much I mean, obviously, he's a different kettle of fish now, but Khan wanted to be the best fighter he could be. And I thought to do that and to literally, you know, go over and live over there and to just start again, I thought that was brilliant. And what a great job Freddie Roach did developing him here, Khan, and, and taking him where he did. But you could see the improvements. as They always had the suspect chin, but you could see the improvements as a fighter. But you know what I'm saying, Russell? That, I know I'm labouring the point, but that education... I heard um, a previous, your previous guest talking about um, Lennox Lewis, you know, when he got knocked out, when he got knocked out by, by McCall and he went with Manny Stewart. It took time. It, it took time to develop him. These things don't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. So, Anthony Joshua, do you want to develop as a fighter and get back to being the or best? Or do you just want to earn money? And if you want to earn money, take the Usyk rematch or swerve it let Usyk fight Fury and get a guaranteed shot at the winner and get 25 million and get out of boxing. That's fine. I have no issue with that. But it's that, it's that question, isn't it, Russell? I know I'm talking a lot. It's that question. What do you want to do? Yeah. What, what do you want to do? And I don't know. I don't know if sometimes the machine becomes too big to do everything that I've just said, which is drop right down. Yeah. Here you go. Again, people, people, you know, Eddie and listen to me would say, you're talking nonsense. He's beaten Joseph Parker. He's done this. He's beaten Klitschko. He's an Olympic gold medalist. You tell me that on one hand, and then on the other hand, you say he's a working pro and he's got L plates on. Which is it? Mm. If he's got L plates on, if he's a working pro, don't match him with Usek and Tyson Fury because yeah. they'll fucking end his career. They'll shatter his confidence. His confidence must already be on the floor. Develop the kid. Bring him back. Bring him back with confidence. Was it... Lennox Lewis, after he got knocked out by McCall, and he came back and he fought Justin Fortune or whatever it was, and he started, he went back, didn't he? He started, yeah. started back at grassroots. He started back at grassroots. He'd been knocked out in two rounds, and he goes, right, do you know what? I'm not as good as I thought I was. Mm. So I'm going to start again. 
And Lennox Lewis ultimately became one of the greatest heavyweights who's ever lived. Yeah. And the rest is history. Yeah. And Joshua, all right, he's 33. He might still have time to do that. Do you know what, Russell? The tools might not be there, by the way. Mm. But we won't know, will we, until he goes Unless back he to school. Go back to school. Because Usyk, the, the danger, you know, the worst thing is if he fights Usyk, beating him. If he beats Usyk and beats him, he'll think then, you see, it was a bad night at the office. And then we get to where we were when he beat Ruiz a second time, because then you fight Fury. Fury absolutely smashes you. And it's no good for him. It's all false economy. He needs to start right back at the beginning. He needs to look at Amir Khan. He needs to look at Lennox Lewis. And he needs to be developed by a coach who's going to be with him every day, non-stop, travel the gyms, spar, spar the Fury, spar these top fighters and get the L plates, keep the L plates on and develop. But boxing's not about that now, is it, mate? No, End of speech, it's about, it's about cash, it's about cash, that's all it's about. Yeah, it's, uh, it's about pound notes. All right, then, well, listen, thanks for coming on, Julian. It's been a pleasure to have you back on the final video of the month. You're very patient, Russell. Can I have one more? You, you asked me off the, rec off the call, you said, have you got a question for the viewers? Oh, you yeah, have a competition. Oh, uh, I've done, you, it, I've done it earlier. I've done it earlier. Oh, have you done it? You've done it. It's fine. I did it earlier. I did it on members' area. Let them have I'll it. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do one. I'll do a Porky's oh. Corner exclusive, okay? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question, and I'm a man of my word, okay? Yeah. And this is authentic. I'm going to ask a question. Now, the first person to email you with the correct answer gets a signed glove by Van der Holdfield. Yeah. How does that sound, mate? Yep. That sounds brilliant. Yep. It's upstairs. It's in my wardrobe. Um, you, I've got a few anyway, but I've got one from Holyfield. First person to get this right. Who was the first English amateur to win every single national amateur title available and go into the Guinness Book of Records? The first... I know English, answers this, but I'm not going to say yep, it. The first English... Amateur boxer to win every single national title available as a junior and as a senior and go into the Guinness Book of Records. And the winner gets a signed glove by Van der Holyfield. And that's to Porky Corner at mail.com. Yeah. And uh, and Julian will post the glove to you and he'll pay the fee. I will, I, I, I promise. And that, that's a reward for listening to me drone on for the last hour. And saying I love Tony Bellew. That's my penance. Is that, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's your fine. Because you were worried about all the porkies uh, setting about you in comment section. Weren't you? <laughs> yeah, I've just I've just bought myself out of that, haven't I? You have uh, with your, with so your real deal glove. With my real deal glove, but Tony's not allowed to go into the competition. But yeah, I'm sure he's got one anyway. But yeah, the winner gets a Evander Holyfield glove, and. It's real. I don't buy. I don't buy shite online. I get these things signed by Holyfield in person, and I'll 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 show a photograph of me with the glove. By the way, with Holyfield, just so you know, it's genuine. Brilliant. Thank you no very worries, much, Julian. You take care. Have a good weekend. Bye. Thanks, everybody. You too, pal. Bye. Bye. Oh, that was Julian uh, McGowan. That was interesting. That today, wasn't it, <laughs> Julian? Buying his son out of uh, getting getting trolled by all the porky hardcores. Now we haven't got nothing against Tony Bell. We just don't want to see him in ring. We want to see him still on some pub door. <laughs> right, then that's about it, really. Signing off for January. All right, I'll see you all in February. Peace out.